Welcome to those of you here on campus and those who are watching our live stream. And welcome to another Saturday Morning Physics event. I'm physics professor Tim Chupp, one of the organizers of Saturday Morning Physics, together with my colleague Professor Roy Clark, Carol Raybuck, Monica Wood, and her staff of the Warren Smith Demo Lab. Uh, I want to take just a moment to acknowledge the financial support of Saturday Morning Physics patrons, and in fact, so many individual members of our community. And I want to thank those of you who observed Giving Blue Day earlier this week. Um, we're also grateful uh, to have the support of the Dr. Mary Lois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideki Tomazawa Endowment, the Walker family, uh, which is uh, sponsoring next week's presentation, and the Van Loo Family Endowment, which is sponsoring today's event. Each year, Saturday Morning Physics invites a complement of the University of Michigan stellar graduate students to present their research in context, and we're very pleased today to have two of them, uh, Larissa Marquant and Blake Hipsley. Uh, before I introduce them, for those of you online, and in fact, those of you here, uh, who would like to send us questions for the question and answer at the end, this email address, physics at umich.edu. Um, we will accept your questions, um, as well as those here uh, can ask them after the presentations. Um, let me introduce our speakers today. In fact, I'm going to introduce Blake first, who will give the second presentation. Blake is a PhD candidate, um, a fourth year graduate student in physics, and he is currently working in the laboratory of Professor Stephen Cundiff on uh, ultra-fast spectroscopy of novel materials, which he'll tell us about today. Prior to coming to the University of Michigan for graduate study, he grew up in Maryland, and he was a first-generation college student and attended the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. Um, outside of his research, uh, he is really uh, engaged in the department and the university, uh, including being the head GSI of the introductory laboratories. Uh, and in fact, I work with him on that. And uh, he's also a member of the University of Michigan Physics Department's Graduate Council. Dr. Larissa Marquant was officially awarded her PhD yesterday. <laughs> so if uh, yesterday morning I was introducing her, I would introduce her as a PhD candidate, but now it's Dr. Marquant. Um, she grew up in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and did her undergrad work at the University of Arkansas in 2017, she started her graduate studies at the University of Michigan. She was an NSF graduate research fellow, a Rackham pre-doctoral fellow in the Department of Astronomy, and um, she'll tell us more about the fact that she was also one of the few graduate student principal investigators of a Cycle 1 James Webb Space Telescope proposal. Um, the results of which will be included in her presentation today. And uh, she will be moving to New Zealand uh, soon, uh, this summer, to continue her career in astronomy. Um, Larissa's talk is a window into the solar system's past with the James Webb Space Telescope. Larissa. Perfect. Oop. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Nope, nope, nope. Let's see, we're on. Oh, I just need it closer. There we go. Is that better? Perfect. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the solar system's past with JWST. Um, there's a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right in. So we're going to start at the very beginning of the solar system. We're uh, talking about how the solar system formed. So the solar system started as a big cloud of gas and dust. Um, that uh, had some rotation to it at the beginning. So as that cloud started rotating, we were able to conserve angular momentum. So I'm going to show you in this demonstration, imagine that this is the cloud of gas and dust, and we start with some angular momentum, and we get a spin. So you guys should be able to see that we end up with this parabola-like shape. 
So this is from the conservation of angular momentum. We have the gas and dust at the center being compressed down. This is where the star would be. And we get the flares up at the edges where the edge of the disk is getting flared up. Um, and so all of the material, most of the material gets concentrated onto the star itself but we still have material around the edges of the disk that is not consolidated. So for following this picture, we have our cloud of gas and dust. It compresses down into a disk, and the disk starts swirling around, and the material of the gas and dust starts coalescing into what we would call planetesimals. So these are little uh, bits of rock and ice that are coalescing into bigger and bigger clumps of rock and ice. Some of these will end up turning into planets, but not all of them which is why we have small bodies in the solar system. These are planetesimals that didn't coalesce into a planet, so they are literally the remnants of solar system formation. So by studying these small bodies, we're able to get a window into the solar system's past. It tells us what material was present when the solar system was forming, and the size and shape tells us how they coalesced and uh, came together into planets. Sorry. So small bodies exist throughout the solar system. So let me move over here. So you can see that there are some concentrations of small bodies. This big ring that's kind of blue is the asteroid belt. And this is the biggest or the most well-known um, set of small bodies. So this is between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. There is a lot of mass here. This might have been a failed planet. Um, so the mass of about a planet is in here. Um, but there are small bodies elsewhere. So you can see this faint blue ring. This is what we call the Kuiper belt. That Kuiper belt is the, essentially the outer asteroid belt. And it's full of small bodies that are more icy in nature. So instead of just being rocky, they also have ice on them. And then we have two very special uh, regions that are kind of pink and light pink. These are called the Greek or Trojan asteroids. And the Trojan asteroids are special because they exist at very special gravitational parking spots. So these are depicting the Lagrange points. This is where gravity cancels out and you can have a stable orbit at these points. There's five of them. But the two that we care about are L4 and L5. Those are the ones that are always ahead or behind the planet, but they have the same orbit as the planet itself. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, these are Jupiter Trojans. So you can see that they're orbiting always ahead or behind of the planet. Um, you can see that they actually form a very large cloud. So they don't exist at just one Lagrange point. They form a big cloud region, which makes it kind of hard to study them because you have to look at a fairly large region of the sky in order to study these objects. Um, and in case you're wondering why these are called Trojan asteroids, when the first ones were discovered, they were discovered ahead and behind the planets. They were called the Greek and the Trojan asteroids from the war between the Greek and the Trojans. And Jupiter was a god that refused to take sides between the war. So it's a little bit of a mythical um, origin. But today we just call them all Trojan asteroids regardless of where they're at. So Jupiter isn't the only one that has Trojan asteroids. We think most planets can host Trojan asteroids, but not all of them. But we think most do have them. Um, but uh, Trojan asteroids don't stay at one location in the solar system. Um, planets, we actually expect, have migrated significantly over the course of the uh, formation of the solar system. In particular, Jupiter and Saturn likely migrated inwards and then outwards. This is called the Grand Tack model. If you're familiar with sailing, they made a little tack to go outwards in the solar system. And uh, they arrived at their current day locations after going through this migration. Uranus and Neptune also migrated and migrated outwards and there's some suggestions that there might be a fifth planet that was actually thrown out of the solar system entirely. So the planets did not form at the locations that they're at today, which means the Lagrange points moved with the planets as they migrated. 
So for the giant planets, Trojan asteroids, these objects are likely not, pre uh, not the objects that were present when the planet was forming. Because the Lagrange point moved, it would have disrupted any primordial population that you had. But we capture objects that were scattered from throughout the solar system. So in particular for Jupiter Trojans, we can sample diff a variety of different asteroid types just by looking at Jupiter Trojans because they're scattered from throughout the solar system. So even though these objects are not exactly what was present when the planet was forming, these are still primordial objects that are relatively pristine and can give us a window into the history of the solar system. So how do we study small bodies? Well, first up, how do we discover them? Can anybody tell me where the small body is in this image? <laughs> yeah, it's the one that's moving. So um, objects in the solar system are near enough to us that they have significant proper motion across the sky. So to discover these objects, we look for moving points that are moving significantly with respect to the background stars. They need to be moving in a relatively straight line. They need to have approximately the same brightness. So that is, allows us to cut out um, a lot of spuriferous um, detections. But we're looking for these moving points is how we discover these objects. Now, for very special missions, we can actually view these objects up close. So this is a GIF from the DART mission, which just happened very recently. This was a mission to actually collide with an asteroid itself in order to change its orbit. This was a planetary defense mission. So as you can see, as we're getting closer and closer to this object, you can see just how much of a rubble pile it is. It's made up of these uh, rocky materials that are remnants of the solar system's formation, and they are just a consolidated clump of these rocky bodies. Um, so for very special objects, we have probe missions where we can go and visit the object directly. But for most other objects, we need astronomy or remote sensing. So we need to use very large telescopes to study the surface properties of these objects in more detail. Um, we can't send a probe mission to every single small body. So by using astronomy, we're able to study the populations of these objects as a whole so we can understand what the population looks like in general. So how do we study these small bodies? Well, they're reflected sunlight. So we have the sun over here, and most of the light that we get off of the asteroid is just reflected sunlight. So I'll talk a little bit in a second about how the composition of this object affects the sunlight it reflects. But in general, they're reflecting mostly uh, sunlight. Now, these objects do get thermally heated from the sunlight, so they can re-emit in any direction this thermal imaging. So this is going to be in the near-infrared. You can see the temperature of these objects. But primarily, if we're looking in the visible light spectrum, we're looking at reflected sunlight. So I'll just walk over here for a second. So we're going to talk a little bit about albedo and how that affects how much light this produces. Are we good? OK. Give me just a second. So what I have here are three different samples of different materials that could be present on the surface of these bodies. It needs time to warm up anyway, so it'll be fine. <laughs> Very exciting demo, I'm sure. <laughs> We can skip it. 
Yeah, so we have the water, we have dirt, and we have sand. And if you were able to see this in the infrared, you'd see that they are different colors. And that's because the light is being reflected off of these objects in different ways. So looking at this image we have on the top, if we have a very chalk-like object, something that's very white, it's going to reflect a lot of sunlight. Whereas if we have something that's very dark in albedo, that's more charcoal, it's going to be very dark. So even though these objects are different sizes, because of their albedo, they're reflecting different amounts of sunlight. So they actually appear to be the same size or the same brightness in the visible wavelength. But if you look at near infrared, this is the temperature of the object, and temperature more corresponds to the size of the object. So by looking at these in near infrared, we can get a better idea as to the size of these objects. Now we can also study these objects to figure out the color of their surface. So this has to do with how light is reflected off of the object based off of its color. So you can see if we have a black object, that's going to absorb all of the sunlight, whereas if we have a white object, that's going to reflect all of the sunlight. So we get much more light coming off of a white object than a black object. But what we care about here is if we have a red object, and that red object reflects just the red light, so that we're able to detect that it's just a red object. So by studying these objects at, in different filters, we can get a measurement of what it looks like at each color. So we do, say, a red, a green, and a blue filter. And by combining those together, we're able to get an idea of the overall color of the object. So just to give you an idea of what filters we're going to be talking about, I have the Johnson Cousins filters on top. These are U, B, V, R, and I. So you, you can see at the bottom what the wavelength range we're corresponding to is. It's all visible spectrum, these uh, filters. We're also going to be talking about SDSS filters, which are G, R, I, and Z. And they have roughly the same wavelength overlap as the Johnson Cousins filters. So now I'm going to talk you through this plot. So we have uh, three different filters that we use to measure the colors of these objects. So on the x-axis, we have the B and V filter. On the y-axis, we have the V and R filter. And what we've done is taken the magnitude, so this is in log scale, for astronomers really like using log scale, um, with our magnitudes. So you get the magnitude in B filter, the magnitude in V filter, and you take the difference between those two magnitudes. And that's telling you whether or not something is brighter in one filter than the other. So for this scale, if we're at um, very high B minus V, we're talking about something that is more red than it is blue. Similarly, if we're at very high V minus R, that's something that's more red than blue as well. So by combining these two together, you can see that we have a wide distribution of different colors. Um, if you're curious about the size, this corresponds to absolute magnitude, which roughly corresponds to the size of the object. So you can see that we have at the lower left, down here, we have kind of neutral objects that are gray in color. We start getting more and more red, and we get up to objects that are as red as Mars. So I'm going to call these objects that are kind of neutral in color red, and these objects that are getting closer to Mars in color. Again, this is invisible light, but we're going to call them ultra red. So just to plot this in a different way, this is again B minus R color. So again, if you're on the left or the right side of this plot, you are more red than you are blue. And I've divided this up into two different sections. We have the red section and the ultra red section. And you should notice two things right away. At the bottom, we have Kuiper Belt objects. Those are the ones in the outer solar system. And they have red and ultra red components. Meanwhile, the Neptune Trojans and the Jovian Trojans only have red objects. So for the Jovian Trojans, this is not super weird because jo Jupiter Trojans are closer in the solar system, so they're subjected to more heat from the sun. So the objects or the 
composition that makes them red, the ices that make them red, are likely irradiated and melted off of the surface so that we only end up with these red objects. But for Neptune trojans, these objects are much further away from the sun, so we shouldn't be subjected to this heating. Um, so it's kind of confusing, especially since we uh, suspect that Neptune trojans come from trans-Neptunian objects that were scattered during that planetary migration process. So they should have the same color distributions as the KBOs that are shown on this plot. So the mystery is, where are these ultra-red Neptune trojans? And I decided to tackle this by going, well, I didn't go. <laughs> I used the Magellan telescopes that are in Chile. I used BADE, which is a 6.5 meter telescope, so a very large telescope, which allows us to study very faint objects. I operated this telescope from my living room. Um, they're not letting people go there right now because of COVID. So I can't tell you how big the telescope is in person, but it's very, very large. And these are my results. So let me walk you through this plot really quick. So very similar to the first plot I showed you, but this is G and R and R and I. So the SDSS filters instead of the Johnson Cousins filters. Again, if we're on this side of the plot, we're more red than blue. And if we're on this side of the plot, we're even more red than blue because of R minus I. And there's three distinct regions that I've colored here. This yellow one is what we're going to call the ultra-red region. The white one is the red region. And the blue is what I'm going to call blue objects. These are objects that are more blue than the color of the sun. So you can see the Jupiter Trojans are orange triangles. The Kuiper Belt objects are blue circles. And the Jupiter Trojans are only red. The Kuiper Belt objects are red and ultra-red. But the exciting thing about this plot is the green squares. So those are Neptune Trojans. And you can see that I have discovered four new objects. This one was previously discovered as ultra-red, so technically three new objects that are identified as ultra-red for the first time. So this brings the ratio of red to ultra-red objects in the, uh, in the Neptune Trojan population more in line with the Kuiper Belt population. So this is resolving that conundrum that we were missing ultra-red objects. Um, we still have plenty of red objects shown in this region, but I also identify three objects as being bluer than solar, and I don't have a good explanation as to why we have these blue objects so far, so this is an exciting discovery that's going to warrant more research. So, but the main result is these three new ultra-red Neptune Trojans. So we can study objects based off of their color, but we can go even more in detail and study these objects based off of their spectrum. So I'm going to have an example of what the spectroscopy looks like. So right now I have a sodium light that is glowing in the sodium uh, wavelength. I'm going to light a flame. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking cis table salt. So what you can see right now is the flame is emitting its own light. So we don't have any um, shadow on the, uh, on the um, uh, band right here. But if I take table salt and I put it in the flame and activate it, we get this very distinct uh, shadow. So the sodium is actually absorbing the sodium light and blocking it based off of its composition. So this happens at a very particular wavelength. So it is like a chemical fingerprint that we have sodium in this sample. So for astronomy, what we have is um, the sun. In this case, it's just shown as a star, but for the solar system, we have the sun. And in between, we have some sort of cloud of gas. And that gas is doing exactly what the sodium did, blocking some of the light at particular wavelengths that are a chemical signature of the 
uh, composition of this cloud. So it's a little bit different for solar system objects. Instead of being a cloud of gas that's absorbing the light, we are actually reflecting light off the surface, and the surface is absorbing that light, but it's the same concept. So what we're looking for is this absorption spectrum where we have bands of blackness, of shadows, and that chemical signature will tell us the composition of the surface of these objects. So the best uh, tool for studying the surfaces of these objects is the James Webb Space Telescope. This is because JWST has a wavelength coverage in the near IR. So what I'm showing here is comparing the wavelength coverage of JWST to Hubble and Spitzer. Spitzer is now defunct, sorry if you like Spitzer. Um, but we're talking about near-infrared, so slightly off of the wavelength coverage of Hubble. And JWST is going to be much more powerful than Hubble. So if you're curious about the size of it, here's a picture of the clean room with JWST, the mirror shown. The sun shield that protects JWST from some light is actually the size of a tennis court. So this is a very large object that we sent into space, actually to the L3 point, so one of the Lagrange points. Now, we really care about this near-infrared coverage because ices, which we suspect cover these outer solar system objects, have absorption bands in the near IR. So by studying the near IR reflectance spectroscopy of these objects, we can tell what their surfaces are made of. So here are the results, the very exciting results. So I have five targets in this image. I've averaged some uh, four red Neptune Trojans, and the average spectrum is shown as the blue line. And then I have one ultra-red Neptune Trojan, and that spectrum is shown as the orange line. And then I've overplotted on these two synthetic spectrums. So one, the blue uh, line is amorphous water, and the green line is triton tholins. Tholins are basically red goop that results from irradiating the surfaces of these objects. So we don't really know what it's made of, but we're pretty sure that it's what makes them red. And in fact, you can see that the red objects have a completely different spectrum from the ultra-red objects, and the ultra-red fits much better to the tholins. So it seems like tholins are indeed the reddening agent that's making some of these objects ultra-red. So what is coming up next? Um, it's very exciting. We actually are going all the way back to the beginning of my talk, and we're actually going to have a probe mission of Trojan asteroids. So this is called the Lucy mission. It launched two years ago in 2021, and it's going to do its first flyby of an asteroid in 20. 25, and its first flyby of a Jupiter Trojan in 2027. And so this is going to be a probe mission that actually takes us to the Trojan asteroids, allows us to study them up close and personal. Um, so this will give us a much better idea of what these objects look like, what they're made of. It'll be revolutionary science, so it's going to be a very exciting mission. So stay tuned for that. So I'll just summarize what we do and do not know about Trojan asteroids. We know that Trojan asteroids exist around most planets. We know that they're pretty pristine remnants of the primordial disk. We know that they're affected by uh, planetary migration. And Neptune Trojans do have red and ultra-red components, and also some blue objects, which we don't know what those are, so more on that to come. Um, and we can tell that the red and ultra-red objects have completely different compositions, where the ultra-reds do seem to have this reddening agent of tholins on their surface. What we don't know is, do Trojans exist around every planet? In particular, do Earth Trojans exist? This is something I've worked on if you have questions about it, but I won't go into too much detail. Um, just how pristine are the surfaces? We're not quite sure. We need to study more of them to see how they are affected by solar radiation, planetary migration, collisions, things like that. Um, we don't know exactly from where in the solar system they originate. It's basically impossible to track where they came from. Um, and for Neptune Trojans in particular, we're wondering if this population could be as large as Jupiter's Trojans. Jupiter has thousands and thousands of uh, Jupiter Trojans, but Neptune we've only discovered about 20. But we think that population could be large or larger than Jupiter's Trojans. 
Um, why are some of these objects blue? Do they have a different composition? And are all ultra-red objects covered in tholins? These are uh, questions that can be answered by JWST in future cycles, so I'm hoping to propose for more time. So fingers crossed for me that we're able to get that time and study these surfaces in more details. And with that, I'll end right here. Thank you so much, Larissa. And while they're transitioning, uh, let me just reintroduce Blake Hipsley. And his presentation will be on a future for electronics. Let me remind uh, those online, and in fact, those here uh, in our audience, that you can send questions to physics at umich.edu, which will be part of the question and answer period that will follow Blake's presentation. Blake. Check. Check. All right. We're good. Thank you so much. Better? Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, this is not working the way that I wanted to. All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, as Tim said, my name is Blake, and I'm going to be giving you a talk today on a class of materials that we can hopefully use to further our current electronics devices. Um, before I get into what that material is, I want to give you guys some background to where we are currently with electronics. Modern electronics rely on these materials called semiconductors, uh, whether it is your phones, your computers, um, anything with a computer chip in it, which seems to be like every device nowadays, even your fridge. Um, they need to have semiconductors in them, and that's helping to control the flow of currents in these materials um, and to do some logic calculations um, inside these devices. Semiconductors, if you're not familiar with, are a class of materials that under certain conditions can allow uh, the flow of electricity, also known as the um, flow of electrons. Uh, and in materials in general, electrons are confined to certain bands of energy. An example that I'm going to show you to start off with are conductors. Everyone's probably familiar with what a conductor is. Um, the reason why conductors are so good at con conducting electricity um, are because the valence bands, which is where electrons are housed usually for bonding purposes, um, and the conduction band where electrons participate in current flow are right up against each other. So electrons can easily move from one band to the other, and you, whenever you need electrons to flow, you have a source of electrons to do this. Um, an example of a conductor is copper, which is why we use copper wiring in a lot of different um, systems. Insulators, on the other hand, have a really large gap between the conduction band and valence band. And so you really can't have electrons flow in these materials because the source of electrons in the valence band just can't make it up there. Um, examples of insulators are such as glass, uh, rubber, wood, um, and this is why these types of materials aren't used in uh, electronics. But semiconductors are in this weird middle ground where the gap uh, between the conduction band and the valence band isn't super large, and so if you were to excite your system, uh, you can actually get a situation where you promote an electron from the valence band into the conduction band and allow it to flow, um, which is why these are really good for controlling when you want current to flow and when you don't want current to flow. When this happens, you actually leave behind a hole in your valence band, and this valence band hole is positive relative to the rest of your valence band, where you have electrons flowing. And so we think of this hole as having, uh, this hole as having a positive charge. When you promote this electron and you have this positive hole left behind, there's a chance where you can have the positive hole and the negative electron kind of bind together and create something called an exciton. This is kind of similar to how you might have a, a proton and an electron bind together to create a hydrogen atom. The difference between the hydrogen atom and the exciton is that the binding energy between the two charges is much weaker in an exciton. It's about a thousand times smaller than compared to hydrogen. And so because it's so weak of a bond, you really uh, require cold temperatures usually in order to have these things be stable and to survive here for long times. Um, for an example, um, the temperatures that you might be seeing for um, excitons to bind will require temperatures that are on the order of like 100 Kelvin. And for those of you who aren't good with units, um, this is roughly on the order of like negative 120, negative 150 Celsius, or like negative 200 Fahrenheit. Um, so really, really cold temperatures. That's not a perfect uh, conversion, but 
rough ballpark of where we're talking about. Um, but exotons are really interesting in that they can interact with light. In the same way that you could have a hydrogen atom um, absorb or emit light, depending on if you can move these electrons that you have uh, into higher energy bands or lower energy bands, you can have a sim similar sort of action with excitons, where you can either um, absorb energy if you were to make your exciton uh, into a higher energy state, or you can actually emit energy if your exciton were to have your electron and your hole recombined. Besides just um, excitons and semiconductors, I also wanted to talk about layered materials. Um, the other sort of downside to normal semiconductors is that they're bulk materials and they have lots of different atoms, lots of different electrons going on. And so it's really possible that you have sort of some screening effects due to the number of electrons that you have. And so if you were to, say, send light in, it might not interact well with the specific exciton or electron that you're trying to interact with. But with layered materials, you can actually get around this. And so to describe what layered materials are, is that these are materials that are weakly sort of bonded together. Um, and the example of this I want to describe is sort of graphene, or um, if it's in its bulk form, graphite. If you're in the audience, you can sort of see a chemical structure of it like so. Um, but the idea is that you have a layer of carbon atoms layered um, and bonded together really strongly, and then another layer bonded really strongly together, but the two layers are only weakly bonded together. And so the reason that it's used in stuff such as pencils is because it's really easy for you to scrape off one of the layers and leave a mark behind on a piece of paper. Um, another common application would be in lubricants, since layers can slide easily against each other. It could use, um, be used to sort of promote when you want things to rub up against each other. Um, so, the cool thing is that when you have these single layers, though, um, you can actually get the sort of um, electron screening effect to go away, since you don't have as many atoms going on. And so, what we would really like to have is a semiconductor that behaves uh, like graphene in the sense that it's a layered material. And so one of the materials that actually combines these two ideas together is transition metal dicocogenides. Um, that's definitely a mouthful, so I'm just going to refer to it as TMDs for the entire presentation. Um, but what are TMDs? TMDs are a layered material, just like graphene, uh, in the sense that it is made from a layer of transition metals, which is, can be found in the middle of the periodic table. In particular, I'm going to be talking about group six TMDs, which comes from the sixth column of the periodic table, which I highlight in purple here. And it also has two calcogen atoms, which falls on this column here of the periodic table. And so you have a layer of transition metals, and on either side of that transition metal, you have calcogen atoms sort of separating it into these single layers. What are some of the properties of TMDs? Well, um, when in you have a single layer of it in sort of a two-dimensional form where you don't have this growth in the third dimension, um, the excitons can actually be stable at room temperatures. Before I said you'd be really, really cold temperatures, there are certain materials um, that actually allow them to survive at room temperature, which would be useful if we're trying to use them for electronics. Um, in addition to that, because you don't have this bulk system with lots of different um, interactions going on and electrons to sort of limit the interactions, you can actually see that uh, when you shine light on it, they have a really, really strong interaction, which could be good for applications where you need light and electricity to interact with each other. And finally, you can actually tune the different properties of what's your energy needed for your exciton to bind, um, what resonance you might emit if you were to emit a light out of it, um, and also how long these uh, excitons can survive for by choosing different types of metals or calcogen atoms in order to create your TMD. In addition, you can also stack these TMDs on top of each other and rotate them in different angles to sort of tune these properties even further. Um, and I like to think of this as kind of building a sandwich. You know, you have your different ingredients you want. Um, you can stack them in any sort of way. Uh, in addition to that, you can also rotate them so that you get that perfect bite of sandwich that you really, really like with all the goodness that you like. Um, and, you know, um, in the same way we can do that with these TMD materials to create really interesting sort of uh, properties. Now, applications of TMDs can include lubricants, such as graph, uh, what we use uh, graphene for and graphite. Um, however, for electronic purposes, we would want to sort of take our electronics that we have currently and push them further. Um, because these TMDs are layered materials with only like three atoms thick, you can make atomically thin um, electrons, electronic device uh, materials, such as transistors and sensors, you know, making our computers go from sizes of rooms to now sizes of what they are currently to even smaller. Um, 
In addition, we can use them in something called optoelectronics, which is something I hinted at earlier, where you kind of take this idea of uh, light interacting with each other and combine it with electronics. So examples of this would be LEDs or lasers. Um, and finally, we can use them to further um, quantum devices and it's particularly quantum computing. Excitons are an example of what could be used maybe as a qubit or a quantum bit. If you're familiar with regular computing, you, computers use bits to store information, either a zero or a one. A quantum bit sort of allows you to be in this weird state where you can be both zero and one at the same time. And it allows you to store more information into a single qubit than you could in a normal bit. Um, so excitons are an example of what you could use as a qubit. Um, I would now want to sort of transition the talk from talking about what these materials are to how we study them. And so to uh, further that sort of how we study them, I want to bring up spectroscopy again. So um, Larissa showed a great example of how to do absorption spectroscopy. I want to give you sort of an alternate sort of description called emission spectroscopy. Um, spectroscopy is a way to excite a sample and then look at whatever light is coming out of it if we're talking about the emission spectrum. Absorption spectrum, you just see sort of what's missing out of it. In this case, we're creating a new signal from the device or a sample that we're looking at um, and sort of plotting that as a function of frequency. And if you're not familiar with what the frequency is, think about different colors of your rainbow. You know, you have different free, uh, colors that associate uh, with different frequencies. So, um, what I want to do is to show this sort of example. Let's say I have the same setup that Larissa did. And I create my flame. And so in normal spectroscopy in, this, in the lab, we use lasers to excite our sample. In this case, I'm going to use a flame. And so if you want to look here, if I turn on this lamp, you should be able to see So if I position the lamp just right, you should be able to see its spectrum from the lamp on the background here. Um, as you see, all this is in the visible light, uh, where the, light, the lamp is producing some light. It has some amplitude at different frequencies or colors and can be shown on the screen here. Now, what I want to do is I want to take the same sort of salt that Larissa used and put it in the flame. And instead of looking at how that uh, light from a sodium lamp is absorbed, I want to see what happens when I excite my sodium atoms and what light they produce. So as you can see, a spike appears in the spectrum, which associates to uh, the light being emitted from the sodium once I excite it. So. In the lab, as I said, we use lasers to excite our sample instead of flame. Um, but the same thing can be, uh, can be true where I excite the sample and some light is emitted from it. And then I can use something called a grading spectrometer, which the grading just separates the light into its different colors. And then I can measure what's the intensity of those different colors with a detector. And what happens is I would get a, some, a spectrum like show. Um, if I'm doing absorption, I can measure what light's being absorbed. Uh, in our case, we're looking at what light is being uh, emitted from our sample when we excite it. Now this technique is good, but we can take it a step further and make it more complicated, because why not? <laughs> there is a reason why we make it more complicated, and I'll explain that in a second, but instead of just sending in one laser pulse, we can send in multiple laser pulses to the sample, and we can vary the time at which those laser pulses hit our sample, and when those laser pulses hit our sample, they interact with each other inside the sample and create a fourth pulse, uh, a fourth uh, signal, if you will. Um, and we can measure that signal with a detector. Um, now, because we're hitting these different uh, laser pulses in our sample at different times, we can create these time time plots at various different time delays. So if I were to move the first pulse a little bit earlier in time, I might get a different tau value, uh, which is the y-axis on this graph that I'm showing. If I were to delay the uh, second pulse a little bit, I can move to, uh, further back in time uh, to create a new uh, Cap, a tau t plot, or if I move when I'm measuring the, the uh, signal that's created, I can move along the x-axis. And so the signal can vary as a function of these three different times. And if I take one of these uh, plots, these tau t plots, I can do some math manipulation and convert it into the frequency domain to create the spectrum um, that I want to. Um, 
So because time and frequency are kind of related, they have units of seconds versus one over seconds, there's some math that I can do that allows me to create plots that look like the absorption spectrum that I showed before. But because I have two time um, variables, I can create something that looks like a two-dimensional spectrum. And this MBCS spectra is what we really want to use to characterize these samples. So, um, and because frequency is related to the energy of whatever X time I'm looking at, um, I can just say, instead of plotting it as a function of frequency, I can plot it as a function of the, free, uh, the energy that I'm either absorbing or emitting in my sample. So, why did I want to make it more complicated with more laser pulses? Well, there's uh, some more information that I can gain from doing this technique of multidimensional coherent spectroscopy, or MBCS, than I can do with just linear spectroscopy. Um, to sort of show that, I want to give you an example here. Let's say that these two tuning forks represent excitons, where they have very, very similar energies, but let's say that I separate, I uh, did something slightly different to them. In a sample, this could be you applying strain to your material, twisting and bending it slightly, um, and this can cause the uh, band gap between your conduction band and your valence band to change, which changes the energy of your exciton. And so if your energy of your exciton changes, the frequency that it's going to emit will change when you excite it. So for one single, um, Oh, hit the record, sorry. Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. OK. So this is sort of the background knowledge, uh, background sound that we're seeing here. If I were to excite one of my excitons and have it emit a frequency, you can see that there's a spectrum associated with that frequency. Now, if I were to hit both at the same time, and they're slightly changed because of the strain that I put on my system, you can see that the width of my spectrum has changed. Let me do that one more time for you guys. So that's just one. That's two that are offset slightly in resonance energy. So what this can tell us is that if I do MDCS, I can actually tell the difference between what's causing something such as strain on my system, which we relate, which we call inhomogeneity, or what's inherent to the system, which is called homogeneity. Um, the inhomogeneous broadening, as I said, could be due to strain, and this causes the uh, energies of specific excitons to change not uniformly across the sample. Um, however, every single resonance that we have in our system does have some natural broadness to it, and so if I just do linear spectroscopy and I get a spectrum like this, I don't know if this is caused by one really, really broad emitter or multiple tiny emitters like so. If I get an MDCS uh, spectrum, though, I can actually tell what's going on here. If I were to measure what's the length of this spectrum along the diagonal, I can tell, oh, that's due to inhomogeneity or strain in my system. If I look at the off-diagonal, I can actually tell what's the homogeneous broadening in the system that's inherent to it. Along with this, MDCS can allow us to see how different uh, excitons are interacting with each other. Um, for example, if I have two different materials, two different, uh, say, TNBs with different band structures, um, I can create two different excitons with different energies. So in layer A, I have an exciton with energy EA. In layer B, I have an exciton energy EB. If these two are, say, stacked on the top of each other, like in a heterostructure, there could be a situation where the exciton could be generated in one layer and move to another, such that if I were to do MCS, the energy might absorb at one layer and then emit at a second layer. There's other prop, uh, ways to get this sort of uh, interaction to go, um, but if I were to have excitons interacting with each other, they could affect how those excitons are being generated in either layer, and I can observe those as multiple peaks in my uh, MDCS spectrum, where the on-diagonal peaks refer to the individual excitons for EA and EB in the system, and these off-diagonal cross-peaks refer to this sort of coupling going on, or this interaction between different layer excitons. So now I actually want to show you some results that we have from MDCS. So this is a MDCS of a tungsten diselenide monolayer. So I just have one layer of a WSE2 chemical compound. And I'm going to be doing MDCS where I have my three pulses at different time delays, create my new fourth pulse, that's called the Foy mixing signal, and I'm going to create a time-time plot like shown here. 
And this is the actual data that we got at this particular blue triangle point on our sample. And if I do the math manipulation I talked about before, I can turn this into the frequency domain and see, oh, okay, the width along the diagonal kind of matches up with the width on the cross diagonal. And so this is kind of telling us that what I'm seeing here isn't necessarily due to inhomogeneity entirely. This might be due just due to what's happening in the material intrinsically. But furthermore, I can see sort of how the resonance and the energy that I'm generating in the NDC spectra changes as I move across the sample to different points. So this is really good. We're seeing uh, variations, not too much, across the sample. Um, but we can take this technique a step further and combine it with imaging. I can send all my pulses through a microscope, if you will. <laughs> um, and because I have uh, the mirrors in this microscope controlled via a rotating mirror, so I can control them with my computer, I can rapidly scan across my sample and create images of whatever this signal that I'm generating is. And so the benefit to this is that from a microscope or white light image, I can see not too many interesting features that would be useful for electronics. But if I were to do an NDCS image with this new signal that I'm generating, I can see that the features are very more, are more prominent for where there's a strong sort of nonlinear signal that I'm creating versus uh, what I would see in the white light image. And this could be useful for identifying some interesting spots to look at in our sample. So what can I do with this new MDCS and with imaging technique? Well, I can look at sort of how long these excitons are living for. So it's not going to be useful if I have an exciton that doesn't live very long if I'm trying to use it for a quantum computer qubit. So for this type of measurement, I just want to delay the um, third and second pulse. So I'm going to be varying my capital T. And now if I vary that uh, time delay, capital T, and I measure the signal as a function of that, I can create a plot like this uh, for these different um, points that I've shown here. Um, and what's interesting is that I can combine this with imaging and take a map across the entire uh, sample. What's interesting with, if you look at these plots, you can see that it looks like there's sort of two decay processes going on. There's a really, really fast decay in the beginning, which I plot here as T11. Um, and you can sort of see that T11 across the sample, for the most part, looks pretty uniform. Um, there's some uh, points in the bottom right corner that are white that don't have a signal. And that's just because we weren't able to get a good signal um, or be able to provide a good fit for what T11 would be at those points. Um, but for the most part, it seems pretty uh, uniform. Um, the slower decay, though, seems to vary a lot more across time. So you get this really, really fast decay that seems pretty uniform, and then a slower decay that seems to vary a lot across the sample. Um, but what you can see with this technique is that we can sort of see these different uh, dynamical properties of the material and see how it varies as a function of where we are looking at in the sample. And so for fabrication purposes, we could use this as a way to diagnostically test, is this a good sample for electronics? Is this going to produce the results that we want? Um, another sort of property that we can investigate is something called exciton dephasing times. So light itself is a wave, sometimes. Um, no, it acts like a wave sometimes, and it has something called a phase to it. And all waves sort of have phases. And sort of this kind of shows how the exciton can hold on to the information of what phase of light was used to excite it. Because um, if it loses that information, obviously that's also bad for quantum computing applications. So to, in order to investigate this property, we've uh, adjust the delay between the first and second pulse and between the third and when we measure the signal that we produce. So uh, to sort of say it in a different way, graphically, we're essentially scanning along when our uh, two delays are equal. And so this new uh, sort of direction that I'm calling T prime, Could you try when we measure across uh, T prime, we get a sort of different graph. It looks similar to the first one, but it's very clear that there's only one sort of decay going on. And we can do this across the sample, as I said before, to sort of analyze, is this sample going to hold the information that I want to, depending on where I excite my sample? So um, as you can see right now, the sample that we're looking at can only hold on to the information for about 10 femtoseconds, which, if you're not familiar with that, is a really, really short time period. <laughs> Um, so maybe this wouldn't be exactly useful for quantum computing applications, but as I said before, we could tune these properties by creating heterostructures. And so just as a peek of what that kind of looks like, this is a heterostructure created with one layer of MOSC2 and one layer of WSC2 on top of it. And 
Um, although I don't show sort of how the dynamics of the exciton dephasing population times, I just wanted to show you that in this sort of example, we do see some interactions between excitons in the, the different layers going on. And that is indicated because we see these different uh, peaks appear on the off diagonals, where this sort of uh, peak relates to the exciton that's generated in the MOSC2, and this peak is uh, related to the exciton generated in the WSC2. But these two peaks don't have something that correlates with them so easily, and that's just showing that there's interaction between these two different layers. So to summarize my talk, <laughs> TMDs, or transition metal dichalcogenides, are materials that have interesting electrical and optical properties. And they have possible uses for atomically thin transistors and sensors, can be used in optoelectronics such as LEDs and lasers, and finally can be used maybe as a uh, way to bridge the gap between where we are with computing and quantum computing in the future. Um, but in order to uh, figure out whether or not these would be good systems for uh, those applications, we have to study them. And we study them with a technique known as multidimensional coherent spectroscopy, or MDCS for short. Um, to wrap up, I just want to thank the University of Michigan Physics Department uh, and the Van Lu family for their endowment to, for this talk. Um, the Cundiff Lab, and specifically Torben Purse for his uh, sort of training and getting you learn the setup uh, in order to produce the results I've shown today. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Blake. Uh, and also thank you again, Larissa. Uh, we'll move to the question and answer period now. We've uh, gotten several questions, <clears throat> which I have here. And what I think we will do is um, I'll start with uh, the questions for Larissa. And then, um, and then we'll go to the questions for Blake. Um, so let me sort these out. So back in the beginning, um, you showed us uh, how we can find small objects uh, in a, sc a screen. And the, I had a question uh, came in about whether the small objects actually, you can resolve their size or whether they're point-like, like the stars behind them. Most of the... Most of the time, they're point-like. They're really pretty small. We're talking about less than kilometer-sized objects. So for the most part, they're point-like. For very large objects, um, you can kind of measure their shape a little bit, but they have to be exceptionally large. OK. Um, you know, on the size of asteroids, well, this is uh, just an interesting question about the DART mission. Um, which is, you know, what is the biggest asteroid that could actually be bumped from orbit, its orbit? That's a really good question, and I think the answer is actively being figured out based off of the DART mission. So they just uh, crashed into the asteroid a few months ago, so they're actively studying the amount of strain and um, the amount of uh, orbit that they were able to change. So I think the answer to that question is going to be upcoming soon, but I don't know. Until we analyze how the collision of DART went better, I don't think we're going to know the answer to that quite yet. And another uh, very general question about asteroids, um, about the minerals and composition of asteroids and whether that would be a, a source of minerals to mine in any practical sense? Yeah, so definitely we know that there's water ice on many asteroids. In fact, the Neptune Trojans that I showed appear to have water ice on their surface. So there's definitely been discussion of mining these objects for their water um, and potential use for if you have missions that are flying very far out in the solar system. As far as right now, I don't think we have a good way to extract those materials very easily. So I think it's a a little bit more sci-fi at this point, but it's definitely something to be thinking about. Great. Um, getting back to more specific uh, aspects of your talk, so there was some interest in, um, in getting more detail on the Grand Track, and uh, what is the evidence for that, and actually maybe just reiterating what it means. 
Yeah, so the grand tack model is where we have, uh, this has to do with there being gas still present in the disk. And so that gas is uh, causing a drag on these objects that causes them to migrate throughout the solar system. So when they migrate in, they actually hit a particular resonance that between the planets themselves, and that causes them to then uh, excite and migrate out Outwards. So it has to do with the gas that's present and the resonances that are hit between the planets themselves. Um, and the question was, um, sorry, what was the question? What is the evidence? Uh, the evidence. So the evidence is actually Trojan asteroids. We can use them to constrain the planetary migration. So based off of the number that we have and their size and shape and location, we're able to constrain the amount of migration that you must have had. Um, there's also evidence um, for other populations in the solar system, but I'm less familiar with that. But definitely Trojan asteroids can be used to constrain this migration. So here's a, a fairly specialized question. Um, one of your spectra showed um, a dip, and uh, our eagle eye questioner said it was about 4.5 microns. And do you know what that's from? Um, so we're actively doing the, the spectral analysis right now, so I don't have a good answer for you right um, off the top of my head. I know that we have some CO2 absorption that we think uh, are observed in addition to the water absorption. So uh, without looking at the plot off the top of my head, it might be CO2 absorption as well. Um, but we're actively doing the analysis right now. We're taking um, lab data and using that to create synthetic spectra to plot against our uh, measured spectra. So I'll have a better answer for you in a few months. <laughs> okay, we'll have you back from New Zealand. <laughs> All right, and um, maybe a, a final question that came in so far. Why don't we know uh, how the population of the Neptunian Trojans compares to the Jovian Trojans? This is, this is a really good question. So we suspect based off of the size distribution that there should be more Neptune Trojans that we haven't discovered yet. But Neptune Trojans have been a historically hard to study population. So in particular, the L5 point has been overlapping with the galactic plane. And the galactic plane has a ton and ton of stars. So trying to find a moving object amongst all of these thousands and thousands of stars is very difficult. But luckily, the L5 point is about to move out of the galactic plane, so now is actually the perfect time to start studying that population to see if there are more objects that we haven't detected. It's also just easier to study Jupiter Trojans. They're nearby, so they're a little bit brighter than Neptune Trojans. Um, so based off of what we've seen so far, we think that there could be thousands of Neptune Trojans, but we need to study even fainter and study the L5 point in order to know more. Okay. Uh, now, we're going to see if there are questions in the room, and I do have to move the microphone around, so we'll do that. Um, so any questions, additional questions for Larissa? I'm curious about the, uh, the Grand TAC um, a little more. Um, I think you mentioned that it uh, occurred over a period of about 600,000 years which relative to the age of the solar system is an instant in time, uh, which begs the question, uh, you know, what caused the grand tack to start and what caused the grand tack to end? And also, um, it went in one direction and then turned around and went the other direction, what caused it to reverse? Yeah, so the reversal, I think, is due to the resonances that happened between the giant planets themselves. So you hit an unstable resonance, and that caused them to then move outwards. So it has to do with the resonance between Jupiter and Saturn itself. It also might have to do with these mysterious fifth uh, giant planet um, that was potentially ejected outwards. That could have also caused uh, some more resonances that drove um, this um, 
migration. Um, as far as why it's so fast, I think as far as, as, far as starting, um, it's going to be related to the amount of gas that was left in the disk, and then that gas gets cleared out. So the timeline for that, I think, is kind of uncertain. But we know, based off of numerical simulations, we think that this should have been a very fast process. So I don't think we have a good um, physical understanding of exactly what's causing this. This is more of a numerical simulations produce this migration, and that is able to recreate observations that we see in the solar system. So the Grand TAC model, I wouldn't say is set in stone at this point. It's definitely a hypothetical, um, but it produces a lot of very good observations in the solar system. In objects that are coming at us like an asteroid, if an object is coming straight at us, would it just be a dot or will you see the line? Because friends of mine who are helicopter pilots tell me they can see tracers, and when you see a dot, that one's coming right at you. Yeah, so I'm not actually... don't want to see the dot. <laughs> I think if something is coming directly at you... Um... I think we would have to rely on the change in brightness that we would observe for these objects. So I don't know anything about the tracers, but I think that you would see a dot coming straight at you, potentially changing in size and brightness. Yes. So. Um, you can track its movement um, with respect to the background stars, and so you might get a line that way. But I'm just not sure. If it's coming directly at you, I think you would have to rely on the change in brightness. Oh, my question is pretty simple. Is there any magnetic field study on this side. I, I think the short answer is no. I'll oh, follow question about the spin. For the rotation speed? Yeah. Um, I don't think that there's really any magnetic studies of these small bodies. For the largest ones, there might be, um, but I'm not aware of them off the top of my head. This is uh, more of the magnetic, magnetospheric studies are focusing on larger objects, so things like moons, which are technically small bodies, but wouldn't be the small bodies that I'm talking about here. To get the rotation of these objects, you actually get the light curve, which is the change in brightness over time, and you can measure the rotation from that way. Is there enough movement to get a spectrum shift reading? Oh, you mean if it's coming towards us, so like a Doppler shift? Um, I think for most of these objects, since they're far enough away, they're not moving significantly closer or further away from us, so I don't observe any Doppler shift. Oh, okay. <laughs> So in your living room, um, were you moving the telescope with a mouse? Uh, not with a mouse. Um, you plug in the coordinates into the program, and you hit Enter, and the telescope moves itself. So I didn't have to click and drag or anything like that. Um, but it was pretty surreal experience to be controlling a telescope on the other side of the planet from my living room. It's a lot of fun. It's not quite as much fun as going to the telescope and getting to go out and look at the stars, but it means that I can like stay on my couch and rest a lot because you're staying up all night. <laughs> Will you get a chance to visit the telescope at some point? Um, I did actually visit a different telescope called the Blanco Telescope, which is also in Chile. Um, I used the DCAM instrument to look for Earth Trojans, and I did visit that telescope. So I've been once, but then the pandemic hit and everything shut down. So. And uh, one last question, which is, when did you become interested in asteroids, and when did you start working on this particular research project? Um, that's a really good question. So I think I've been kind of 
generally interested in asteroids. So I got interested in physics and like middle school and high school. I saw documentaries on dark energy and thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, but I've always loved rocks. And so these are big space rocks. So the idea of getting to study them was really exciting to me. Um, and I just happened to, when I came to the University of Michigan, I wasn't even planning on taking this research project. Um, David Gertis um, just happened to have one where he's studying um, asteroids with the dark energy survey, so still using dark energy data to look for these moving objects, so kind of a serendipitous study, um, and it just happened to work out. As far as why I'm interested in Trojan asteroids, I did a search for Earth Trojans and just thought the one-to-one -one resonance was really cool and just kept studying it. Okay, and also Monica tells me that she managed to get this working, so we want to give you a chance to oh. run us through it, the albedo demonstration. Perfect. Okay, so let's see. Can you see my finger on here? There we are. This is water, this is sand, and this is dirt. So you can see the water has heated up significantly from the lamp. Yep, sorry. Yep. There we go. And you can see that uh, the sand is not reflecting very much light. And the dirt, because it's absorbing all of that light, is getting significantly hotter. So based off of the composition of these objects, they absorb or reflect different amounts of light. So because this is absorbing all the light, it's getting very warm. The question was whether that is Oh, the circular. What are the circular patterns? Yeah, that's the Petri dish that it's in. It's the Petri dish that the material is in. OK, thank you, Larissa, for answering all those questions. And now. And now we have questions for Blake. Let's see. Let, let me start with this about your, um, you talked about graphene a little bit. And the question is, uh, it, does this occur naturally or does it somehow have to be fabricated? Is there an industrial process, et cetera? How is graphene produced? Um. I'm not too familiar with the actual process of how it is fabricated. Uh, what I understand is that it does occur naturally in this sort of structure that is shown here. I'm assuming in order to get it to be useful in different sort of uh, applications such as pencils or lubricants, like there would have to be some manufacture process to it. Um, but these materials do just exist out naturally with their uh, layered structures. Graphite. Graphite, yeah. And then the two-dimensional aspect of it is that? Uh, so there's different, because these, uh, between the layers, the bonds are really weak. It is possible very you know, naturally just to have them separated out. Um, usually, you would have to do something to, like, so for an example with uh, graphene and graphite, uh, when they originally wanted to start studying the individual layers of it, they noticed that if you took a piece of scotch tape and just put it on uh, uh, a, a bulk system of uh, graphite, you were able to rip off just a single layer of graphene. Um, so it, it, it's really easy, you know, simply to just get those layers separated just by doing something as um, you think trivial as that. So it, it is possible that, you know, just out in nature that you could have something just single layers of graphite um, just sitting around just because they're so weakly bonded together. Um, so getting to your um, TMD TMDs. materials, uh, what covers the actual choice of the row, whether it's selenium, uh, sulfur, oxygen, or uh, for the metals, chromium, what, molybdenum, tungsten? So that, I guess that would more so depend on the particular uh, exciton energies or the particular properties that you'd want in your material. Um, I would think that the uh, sort of choice of the calcogens, which is the sulfur, selenium, tellurium uh, row, like that row I think is pretty fixed just because the structure that you would need to get the layers to work out um, needs those types of atoms. 
but the, the particular calcogen you use, the particular transition metal you use, I think is more um, arbitrary, depending on what properties you specifically want. Um, the ones I show there have specific ways that in which like the excitons you generate are very efficient, well, efficiently generated, but also have really strong um, uh, resonances when you do actually excite them. Okay. Um, you know, along these lines, how are the samples fabricated? How are they made? I'm not too familiar with the fabrication process. Um, I know that there uh, have been um, different techniques that are used. I think the ones that I've shown here were uh, produced via a process called chemical vapor deposition. Um, in short answer, they're very difficult to fabricate. And if you saw the size scale of the ones that I'm looking at, they're on the orders of about 20 microns by 20 microns, so very, very small. Um, and, you know, just the fabrication process itself isn't 100% quite there yet. So applications of these materials, like in electronics, are a little bit far away uh, based on current fabrication standards. Um, and that's one of the t uh, more engineering challenges is trying to find ways to produce them reliably, but also um, on a bigger scale. Chemical vapor deposition. Chemical vapor what is deposition. That? I, <laughs> that's a great question. Like I said, more, my uh, research kind of focuses more on just studying them, not making them. Um, from what I understand is that you uh, sort of excite a plasma, and as a result, uh, your uh, material that you want sort of gets deposited on a substrate. Um, and can, you can sort of tweak sort of how much material you'll get up uh, on your sample just by, I guess, the excitation of that plasma. Maybe on scotch tape. <laughs> Probably wouldn't be the best one. Um, do you know why they're triangular? The the one picture you showed us, it was pretty small, ten microns. That uh, how I, small I, is that actually? So, if for those of you who are familiar with that scale, um, a human hair is on the scale of about a uh, hundred microns in thickness. So it's the size of this is thinner than your hair. Um, the triangle nature, I think, just has to do with the fabrication process and whatever sort of um, the way that the uh, material gets deposited on there ends up just being in triangles. It must be rather precious. You showed us all these data from, that's just one sample? That's just the one sample um, that I was showing. And that sample was on like a sea of all these different other triangle um, structures. And in your um, microscope uh, data pictures, uh, where you could look at different positions on that small triangle. Um, where the edge, it, most of them were along the edge, it seemed, most of the data points. And I was wondering, is there some difference at the edges? I was wondering, well, <laughs> so that's in fact true. We, well, once we did the um, one image with the uh, nonlinear signal that we were generating, we noticed that we were looking for particular interesting areas that had really strong resonances, um, really strong signals. Um, because if we're trying to take an image with this, if you're not getting a good signal, you're not going to get a good image or good results. Um, so we just looked at particular areas that had uh, really strong um, resonances. And those are probably just due to um, the microscopic strain on the sample, where just on the edges, you get might have a slightly different um, uh, sort of, I guess, exciton energy. And that, that just has a stronger signal. Um, another thing that could affect it would also be just residue on the sample. There's just something on the sample that's blocking uh, or changing the way that the light interacts with the material. You could also get different resonances as well, or different strengths and energy. So could you say a little bit more about um, how excitons and excitons and TMD um, might be used in a quantum computer? Right. Um, so the idea is that your exciton kind of has two states. It can either be excited or unexcited. Um, but furthermore, with a qubit, you want something where you could have a sort of weird combination between the two. Um, the fancy term is superposition. Um, and so there are ways in which you could have a sort of combination or mixture of having the exciton be excited and non-excited at the same time. Um, and so if you were able to do that, you could use that as a way to um, have different types of information stored in it. Not only is, oh, is it excited or unexcited, but is it excited slash unexcited combination at this degree or this sort of percentage um, and go and um, use it in sort of that kind of way. Okay, are there questions for Blake in the room? Oh, 
Okay, well, uh, two more. Um, one that you kind of alluded to, but uh, can it be foreseen when these might be in practical use? Um, as far as TMDs as a way for practical use, I think we're still a little way just because the scale of them is a little bit challenging. Um, I know that currently there's uh, different types of systems that have been kind of used to start being made quantum computers that aren't TMDs, which are, you know, more so exciting. That kind of thing is called trapped ions. I'm not in, in that field, but um, as far as with uh, applying TMDs to electronic applications, we're a little far away, although they are currently being used in things such as lubricants. Um, I think there's a type of lubricant that's like MO something, MOC2 actually based. Yes. Here's a question. Yes, you do. <laughs> I think it's for the online audience more than us. I will be able to hear you. Oh, okay. uh, have any um, of the large electronic corporations expressed any interest in your research? I don't believe so. I believe a lot of the, if you're thinking like Microsoft or Microsoft or like, um, IBM and stuff, I think they're more so trying to take old systems with, based on silicon and try to convert those into um, quantum computers as opposed to using uh, naturally sort of um, systems that like, such as the trapped ions or the TMDs to produce that kind of stuff. So those major electronic companies aren't, but there are some more niche, uh, you know, up and coming companies that are using uh, these techniques, um, not specifically TMDs, because we're still a little far away from getting that to a larger scale. Um, but there are uh, some fewer smaller ones that are using it. I, I, I'm trying to think. There's uh, one, there's a company known as Continuum that's using, I think, the trapped ion technique to sort of start building these types of uh, electronics. Okay, and the last question, Blake, is uh, when did you become interested in physics and then in either spectroscopy or materials? I think my interest in physics started when I was around in high school. I liked math a lot, but I realized I wasn't going to do a whole lot with just math. At least that's what I thought at the time. Um, and so I wanted to get a science that was related to math, and physics was the most math science that I could think of um, or that I was exposed to. And then my particular interest in sort of spectroscopy and optics and stuff started when I was an undergrad and got a chance to work in a research lab after my first year uh, there. And I just have been stuck in an optics lab ever since. Okay, great. Well, let's thank uh, Larissa and Blake again for great presentations <laughs> and a great discussion. We have two more Saturday morning physics events uh, next week and then on April 15th. And next week will be the Walker family lecture, which will be on quantum technologies, in fact. So we look forward to seeing you then. Have a great week, everyone.